here at the U.S. Census Bureau, wondering if we really count. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to A Lesson in History, a look at the history of Prince George's County. On today's show, we'll be looking at the explosive population growth of the Suitland area, the still questionable role of Mary Surratt in the Lincoln assassination, and how a small community became America's premier airfield. There's no better metaphor for how quickly Suitland grew than here at the Census Bureau, where the changes in population occur so quickly that the computer has a hard time keeping up with us. Locales in the area, once distinct, have now expanded to such a point that boundaries have blurred. The first national census um, was taken in 1790, which is, of course, 200 years ago. And we have taken the principal census of population as, as we are doing this year, every 10 years. Um, originally, the Bureau headquarters were in Thomas Jefferson's office in New York City. But ever since the Capitol moved to Washington, we have been in this area. The first time, however, that headquarters were ever in outside of Washington City. Uh, was when we moved here to Suitland in 1942 um, into a new building where the people from downtown really didn't want to come. Uh, they figured this was pasture land out here, but they soon found it was a few degrees cooler than it was um, in Washington. And soon we had 3,500 people on the average working in two buildings um, the one built in 1942 and the second in 1946, these are connected by a tunnel. But every 10 years, uh, when we're at the peak of the census, and we have something like 350,000 people working on it all over the country, a lot of us at Suitland get moved off to other buildings in the surrounding area, and the history staff, which I uh, am chief of is in a brand new building called Presidential Plaza at the end of one of the runways at Andrews Air Force Base. It's pretty noisy around here, but the screech of jet engines still sounds like progress to people in Suitland. We're here at Andrews Air Force Base, <laughs> formerly Camp Springs Air Base, home of Air Force One, the plane of presidents. The opening of Andrews Field back in the 1940s meant many new jobs had to be filled, new roads built, new services provided. Farmers left the tobacco fields for salary jobs, many for the first time in their lives. They became firemen, construction workers, and carpenters as airport runways and bivouacs took the place of neatly ordered rows of corn and tobacco. They created what was, in effect, a new city where supplies could not quite keep up with the demands. New residents had few places to call home. As they poured into Andrews, trailer parks and quickly built garden apartments were barely enough. And getting a roof over their heads was only the beginning. Long waiting lists formed for much of what we take for granted, even things like telephones. Well, developing Andrews Air Force Base, known then as Camp Springs, was very difficult because most of that land was rural, farmland, and lakes, and all the land wasn't even developed. The base changed its name in March of 1945 in honor of General Frank M. Andrews, who was a general in the United States um, Army at the time before it came to the Air Force in 1947. And for most um, older Americans, Andrews would always be remembered probably in the history of our history books as the day that Air Force One brought the former president of the United States, the 35th president, home for the last time aboard Air Force One, where Johnson, President John, Vice President Johnson at the time, was sworn in as the 36th president of the United States. And for most people who don't realize the, how the history works is that he really didn't need to be sworn in. He automatically, upon President Kennedy's death, became the president of the United States. But Johnson had a keen sense of history and the aura that history would portray that day he took it upon himself 
to show America his strengths, to be sworn in and show the American people that he was in charge and that we would get over that sad day. Local merchants rubbed their hands with glee as the new residents clamored for more and more goods and services. <laughs> Shopping centers seemed to appear overnight. From the very beginning, places like Marlow Heights, Iverson Mall, and Penmar were hard put to keep up with the local demand. Even today, they continue to expand and represent some of the busiest shopping centers in the area. The march of the malls will no doubt continue. Today, Sudland is home to the Paul Garber facility, where some of the nation's most historic aircraft and space hardware are on display. You can also find the home of the acronyms. NESDIS, the National Environmental Satellite Data Information Service, which is part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And befitting all these important neighbors is one of the nation's premier high schools, Suitland High School. A visit by a president to pay tribute to its accomplishments is just one of the many accolades that this distinguished school has received. Before there was a Suitland High School, there were many other smaller and less famous schools. The school board purchased one half acre of land on Silver Hill Road in 1891 and built a one-room school. The kids in the class of 1898 posed for pictures just like kids today. Suitland Elementary grew to a two-room school before 1915, and in 1922, a new four-room school was built. In the class of 1935, my future husband was sitting in the front row. One of the families that had children in the early schools was the Suits, the family Suitland is named for. Colonel Samuel Taylor Suit was born in Bladensburg, but had lived in Kentucky and New York before he returned to the area. He was a businessman, politician, agriculturalist, road builder, and a very active person. He also entertained President Ulysses S. Grant in his home. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. From Faye Norton, a writer of local history, we go to a lady whose past is something to write about. Mary Surratt is one of Prince George's and America's most infamous women. Back in the 1800s, Mary led the quiet life of an innkeeper with her husband, John. But when John died in 1862, the widow Surratt found the job of maintaining the property too much. And after a valiant struggle, in 1864, she leased her home in Maryland and opened a boarding house in Washington, D.C. Mary's world, and that of most Americans, was turned upside down on April 14, 1865. President Abraham Lincoln was shot that evening at the Ford's Theater by actor John Wilkes Booth. Because of his broken leg, he stayed on horseback right outside the tavern door. However, a boy that was with him, David Harold, actually is the one who came in, picked up whiskey to try and ease the pain in Booth's leg, and also picked up one of the two carbines that had been hidden here. That one rifle that remained at Surratt House actually became some very damaging evidence used against Mrs. Surratt. Unfortunately for Mary, Booth had been a frequent guest at her boarding house. After making his escape from the crime scene, Booth stopped at the Surratt Tavern. Mary's fate was sealed when proprietor John Lloyd testified that she had asked him to give Booth field glasses and a gun. Mary was hanged for her alleged role in the plot to assassinate the president. Scholars to this day dispute the verdict, especially since she was convicted by a military tribunal. 
Just two years later, her son, John, a known member of Booth's gang, was tried by a civil court, and he did not suffer the same fate as his mother. The jury never reached a verdict, and he was eventually set free. Actually, there was no law in those days against a civilian being tried by a military court. And since it was the commander-in-chief of the United States forces who had been killed, and because Washington was under military law because of the war, the attorney general actually ruled that it was perfectly proper for the civilians to be tried by a military court. Oddly enough, there was a case pending before the United States Supreme Court very similar to this, and within six months after Mrs. Surratt was hanged, the Supreme Court ruled that it was no longer legal for a civilian to be tried by a military court. Mary's neighbors defended her to the end and continued to honor her name. Surrattsville appears on street signs, schools, libraries, and commercial developments throughout the Clinton area. Today, the Surratt House has been restored and provides the perfect setting for holiday celebrations and reenactments of weddings and funerals by costume docents that make you feel like the 1860s are here again. John Wilkes Booth had few choices for an escape route. Route 4, the Marlboro Pike, and Route 5, Branch Avenue, have historically been gateways to the city. During the War of 1812, American and British troops spent the night right here, both of them on their way to Washington. People passing through here today aren't intent on burning the White House as were the Britishers back then. Instead, they find so many communities, jobs, and commercial centers that many of them never even make it to Washington. For the people in District Heights, Forestville, Clinton, and other Suitland area towns, there really is no place like home. So let's click our heels three times, Mia, and say goodbye for now. Goodbye for now. We'll see you next time here on A Lesson in History.